When I was living in Reno, one of my co-workers had a retirement party at the Shushboom Brewing Company. The trip to getting there was fine for the most part. I simply rode on the sidewalks as everyone does because you would have to be crazy to ride in the painted gutters on a 40 mile per hour strode. I made it to this intersection, carefully crossed to the other side, and then I noticed that there was nothing. I found myself walking along a dirt path adjacent to what is essentially a highway with the last obstacle being this tree. When capturing footage to recreate the journey, I gave up around here. I did see that there was a bus stop right in front of the building, but this is a bus stop for the RTC Regional Connector, a weekday commuter bus with three morning trips and three afternoon trips, which makes it impractical to take the bus to this building. On the other side of the road, there is a bus stop for a more practical route, but I still would have had to traverse the dirt path anyway. There was absolutely no consideration for how people arrive without a car. When I got here, I couldn't help but think about how ridiculous this was. The Shushboom Brewing Company is a bar. Bars serve alcohol. Alcohol is known to impair someone's ability to drive a car. Despite this, this bar is almost impossible to reach without driving or being driven. To make matters worse, Reno's urban planning decisions actively encourage people to drive to places like this. A bar is required to have one parking spot for every 200 square feet of space. This policy ensures people who drive have a place to park, while any other mode of transportation is neglected. It doesn't seem like a particularly good idea to build a bar in a location that is inaccessible without a vehicle. Compare and contrast this with a trip to the Queen Anne Beer Hall in Seattle. Here, there are plenty of transit options that can get patrons within a few blocks of this establishment. Seattle is also generally better at building sidewalks than Reno is, so the hardest part of walking here would be the hills. Riding a bike or a scooter here is easier because there are occasional protected bike paths and slower, narrower streets with less traffic. It's also surrounded by a hotel and residential buildings, so people who live in the nearby neighborhood can have an easy time walking here. There is parking in the area, but you're a lot more likely to find paid parking spots than free parking in this part of town. Parking in this lot would cost $20 a day, and the on-street parking is priced hourly. By locking the parking behind a paywall, it helps further discourage people from driving here. It certainly could be more pedestrian and bike-friendly, but it is still a lot more accessible than the Shushboom Brewing Company. It's important to look at stuff like this because a drunk driver is more likely to originate from a bar that is inaccessible without a car than a bar that is accessible by alternative means and even has measures to discourage people from driving there. I imagine someone is going to point out that it isn't fair to compare a bar at a suburb of Reno to a bar near downtown Seattle, but I disagree. The location within the city is irrelevant. If my coworker picked a bar closer to Reno's downtown, I could have easily complained about the same issues. A lack of adequate bike infrastructure, a lack of pedestrian infrastructure, a lack of transit options, and the list goes on. There are a lot of reasons I left Reno, and that was one of them. I am passionate about good urban planning. I strongly believe nobody should have to drive a car to participate in society. And it's not a personal preference either. There are a lot of consequences to building a city where driving is the only way to get around, which is why I feel the need to spend so much time educating people on how car-centric urban planning is fundamentally wrong. Urban planning shapes everyone's decisions in ways they may not even be aware of, and one of those decisions is driving to a party, a bar, a sporting event, somewhere that serves alcohol, followed by drinking and driving home. It is important to understand that alcohol is not the inherent issue here. People consume alcoholic beverages for a variety of reasons. In a previous video, I talked about the concept of a third place. The third place is a term coined by Ray Oldenburg. The first place refers to where someone lives, the second place is where they work, and the third place is where they hang out and socialize. A third place is designed to attract people of different walks of life into one centralized location, so regulars of a third place get to know more about each other and their community. A bar or a local pub is one example of a third place. 
A location like this offers a cozy setting for people in the immediate neighborhood to casually consume alcoholic beverages as a way of relaxing or celebrating. Some people may be apprehensive to having bars in their own neighborhood, but the bars Oldenburg describes are more akin to English pubs. The stereotype of the American bar as a cheap-looking, ugly place does justice to all too many of them. In contrast, the typical English local lends charm and color to the area in which it is located. That aesthetically disastrous aggregation of parked cars beside the typical American tavern is absent from most British pubs. What's interesting is that even though these English pubs are so common, the United Kingdom isn't even one of the worst countries for drunk driving. Meanwhile, the United States is the third worst country in the world when it comes to drunk driving. The English pubs are a focal point for the community to socialize among each other. And the social drinking is mostly harmless. As long as someone drinks moderately and responsibly, there should be no serious consequences because of their alcohol consumption. Part of that responsibility means making smart choices so not to endanger yourself or others. As the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration puts it, being a responsible driver is simple. If you are drinking, do not drive. While this advice is fine in a vacuum, it doesn't really address the elephant in the room. Why is it still okay to build the local pub in a place that cannot be accessed by walking or taking transit? Personal responsibility only goes so far, and focusing on an individual's decision-making neglects the outside factors that led to their decision. This overemphasis on personal responsibility is a way of dumping the negative externalities of a car-centric transportation system onto others. It's not just drunk driving either. Pedestrian safety campaigns tend to focus on making sure people be visible, cross at the crosswalk, and make predictable movements. You must be careful while the system allows cars to be dangerous. Similarly, when it comes to establishments that serve alcohol, it's not the city's responsibility to place them in pedestrianized areas that are easily accessible by transit. It's someone else's responsibility to drive sober or find a designated driver. I wholeheartedly disagree with this premise. If someone drives somewhere, chances are that is how they were planning on getting home anyway. It should be the duty of city leadership and urban planners to reduce people's dependency on cars so they don't feel the need to drive in the first place. Telling someone if they're drinking, do not drive, is sound advice, but it is worthless when there are no genuine alternatives. Value Penguin surveyed 1,000 Americans and found 40% of them admitted to drinking and driving, and 45% of them have admitted to getting into a car with an intoxicated driver. The most typical excuses for this was because it was only a short drive, they didn't think they were that drunk, or they had no other way of getting home. While this survey does have a small sample size, it is helpful for understanding the rationale of why someone may choose to drink and drive. In the United States, nearly half of all vehicle trips are for distances of three miles or less. These distances could easily be traversed by other means, but oftentimes urban planning decisions makes it impractical or impossible to get somewhere without a car. So people drive out of necessity. It becomes their default action for every single trip. People in car-dependent places like Reno cannot take transit or walk to their favorite bars if they wanted to. In fact, the streets are so dangerous that city officials advise people not to cross the street while impaired. Our roads sadly have already seen too many crashes and pedestrian fatalities this year. We want everyone to be safe on New Year's Eve, so we're reminding everyone, never drive or cross streets while you're impaired, don't be distracted, and make sure that you're paying attention. So when it's difficult to walk somewhere, and dangerous to walk home when impaired, there's no cycling infrastructure, and the transit service is anemic and unreliable, what do you expect people to do except for get in their cars and drive everywhere? This should be concerning in the context of locations that serve alcohol, because even a small blood alcohol concentration can impair someone's ability to drive. At 0.02 blood alcohol concentration, someone may experience a decline in visual function and a decline in the ability to divide attention. At 0.05, someone may have reduced coordination, difficulty steering, and reduced reaction times. 
At point zero 0.08, someone may lose coordination, show poor judgment, and show poor speed control. The negative effects on driving only grow more extreme as more alcohol is consumed. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, nearly 10,000 people are killed per year due to alcohol-related crashes, making up nearly 30% of all traffic fatalities. Nobody should die because they were or someone else was intoxicated, which is why ending drunk driving is an important effort. However, when establishments that serve alcohol are placed in areas that are inaccessible without a vehicle, then it feels tolerable, at least from an urban planning perspective. So how did we get to this point with drunk driving? The book One for the Road details the history of drunk driving within the United States, and it claims the growth of the suburbs and the interstate highway system practically ensured an explosion of drunk driving. The author, Baron Lerner, describes the 1950s and 1960s as the golden age of drunk driving. It wasn't treated as a public health issue, so there was a lot of tolerance for people who drove intoxicated. He goes on to say, beyond the limits of both legal and public health approaches, Another less obvious factor was promoting a tolerance for drunk driving, suburbanization, and the growth of automobile culture. This prosperity for driving was helped by a flourishing post-war economy, which enabled Americans to purchase cars at an unprecedented rate. Between 1950 and 1970, the number of cars on the nation's roads increased by almost 250%, from just over 40 million to 90 million. Meanwhile, the Eisenhower administration dramatically expanded a highway construction program that had begun into the interwar years, leading to a massive growth of the country's interstate system. Sensing new business opportunities, entrepreneurs opened motels, fast food, restaurants, and gas stations along these throughfares. Suburban families readily took to their cars to patronize shopping centers, drive-in restaurants, and drive-in movies. Alcohol was not an essential component of this new fascination with automobiles, but many drivers partook. After all, when they exited the new highways and took smaller roads to cities, smaller towns, and resorts, they could increasingly find bars and liquor stores which sold alcohol. Because of this nonchalant attitude towards drunk driving, there was a rise in drunk driving activism over the course of the 1980s. Mothers Against Drunk Driving became the centerpiece for an activism campaign, and they, along with other advocates, would share their stories about drunk driving tragedies, and this activism eventually influenced the drinking laws we see today. In July 1984, Ronald Reagan signed the Minimum Drinking Age Law, which sought to force states to pass laws prohibiting the sale of alcohol to individuals younger than 21. States needed to comply or lose millions of dollars of federal highway construction funding. This was a massive victory for anti-drunk driving campaigns across the nation. In addition to these laws, there was also a social stigma building around drunk driving. The Harvard Alcohol Project, for example, sought out to demonstrate a new social concept, the designated driver. The New York Times reported on the campaign's launch in a front-page story on August 31st, 1988. The three major television networks and the Hollywood studios that produce most of their programming are joined in a coordinated attack against drinking and driving that will include dialogue in popular entertainment shows as well as public service advertising. They believed by inserting responsible drinking habits into shows like Cheers and Dallas, they could shape social reality and nudge people into more desirable behaviors and habits. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Harvard Alcohol Project, and other advocacy groups, along with this new legislation, were important factors that led to the decline in alcohol-related traffic fatalities from 25,000 in 1988 to 17,000 in 1994. They successfully created a social stigma against drunk driving and created a movement to change laws around alcohol. This effectively set the precedent for how drunk driving is tackled into today. Unfortunately, we are no longer seeing a decline in alcohol-impaired driving crashes. From 2008 to 2017, there has been a consistent trend where one-third of all traffic fatalities are alcohol-related. This is because our approach to ending drunk driving is missing a crucial element disincentivizing driving itself, so people only drive when they absolutely need to. When private companies such as Uber and Lyft fill the gaps in an anemic transit system, there is actually a reduction in DUIs. 
It doesn't reduce alcohol consumption, it just provides a safer way of getting home. However, Uber and Lyft only really exist because of a lack of transit options. These are private companies who are trying to fill in the gap between automobiles and an anemic transit system while exploiting their workers for profit, so this should not be treated as a replacement to a functioning transit system. Second Thought has a great video on what's wrong with gig economies if you want to find out more. Nevertheless, it indicates that investments in transit and adequate alternatives to driving may help combat drunk driving. Sadly, investments to reduce our dependence on cars is not the solution that has been pursued. Instead, it is a typical American solution of doubling down on PSAs, safety slogans, scare tactics, policing, and anything else that doesn't involve reducing people's dependence on cars. People may have seen safety messages along freeways saying stuff like drive hammered, get nailed, among other things. In Reno, the Nevada Highway Patrol building has a banner featuring a series of glyphs about drunk driving. Ironically, in order to read these messages, someone would have to divert their attention from the road in front of them to the banner. Highway safety slogans and other messages aren't helpful. The intention is to nudge people into socially desirable behaviors, but studies have shown that these make roads even more dangerous as they force the driver's attention away from the road and onto the sign. Other forms of nudges are PSAs. These commercials start out with a caricature who had a few drinks too many, and they drive home anyway, leaving them to deal with the various repercussions. These are meant to instill the idea that if you drive drunk, you will be caught, and there will be various penalties, such as a $10,000 fine and a revoked license. It's a form of social norming to prevent or discourage harmful behaviors. Another, more extreme option to get the point across is a mock DUI. These are typically presented to high schoolers during prom season and graduation to scare them out of drunk driving during their celebrations. One popular nationwide program for this is every 15 minutes. This event lasts for two days. On the first day, someone dressed as a Grim Reaper will select students to be victims of a two-car crash DUI. These students become members of the living dead. Tombstones are placed on the school campus so friends and classmates can pretend to mourn their loss. The students involved in the incident are given a makeover with a bunch of gory details. Later in the day, a mock car crash is set up, showing the graphic scene that may happen while driving drunk. The evening ends with students writing letters to their loved ones, expressing the thoughts they would convey if they had not been killed on that day. On the following day, there is a mock funeral for the victims, where the parents say how it affected them. The assembly concludes with a call to action challenging everyone in the auditorium to make responsible choices when alcohol is involved. The whole ordeal is filmed, edited, and uploaded on YouTube, so you can find all sorts of other examples of high schools participating in the program. If you think this whole ordeal is insane, it probably is. Rather than allowing teenagers to enjoy their final months of high school in the hopes that it'll prevent them from driving drunk over the course of their lives. Some people may defend these mock DUIs by saying if it can save one person, then it's worth it, but there are plenty of reasons to doubt the efficacy of these scare tactics. Various studies have found there to be little to no consistency to the impact alcohol education programs have for young people. According to the New Zealand Alcoholic Beverage Council, 58% of alcohol education programs they evaluated resulted in behavior changes among the participants. They found these programs can induce desired behavior changes, but it largely depends on design and implementation. And several studies of every 15 minutes found that the implementation doesn't seem to be particularly good. The Washington Traffic Safety Commission compiled a long list of different studies that evaluated programs like every 15 minutes. They concluded that these alcohol prevention programs have not produced any significant long-term outcomes on attitudes or behavior. While they may produce some short-term changes in knowledge or attitudes, they may not produce any changes in behavior, or those changes may be waning after six months. It may leave an impact on some individuals, but to others, it's merely a hysterical spectacle in the weeks leading up to prom and graduation. Of course, there is always going to be people who drink and drive despite these PSAs and scare tactics. One of the biggest failures of America's policing system is the blatant inability to look beyond the individual who makes bad decisions and see the systematic issues that led to the problem in the first place. 
It is an endless game of whack-a-mole. Law enforcement must identify the person who failed to act in a legal, predictable manner, which means they are essentially going off a checklist when analyzing traffic incidents. They look for speed, seatbelt usage, distractions, and impairments. Hence why articles point out if speed or alcohol was a factor in a crash, with no consideration for road and street design. I believe this is a terrible system, one that is painfully complicit with the status quo. Too much emphasis is placed on the drinking component and never the driving component, as though it is easier to control the alcohol than the incessant need to have everyone drive everywhere. It is unreasonable to expect everyone to be in the right state of mind to drive at any given time. In fact, someone may behave like a drunk driver when they're actually just too tired to drive. I mentioned this in a previous video, but I don't like how that video turned out, so I will reiterate it here. Researchers at Utrecht University in the Netherlands conducted a study that had people drive at night while staying in the center lane. Their performance was monitored and they checked for lane deviations. Two hours of nighttime driving resulted in the same errors experienced with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05. After three hours, it was comparable to 0.08. Furthermore, one Australian study found driving after four to five hours of sleep doubles the risk of a crash, which is the same risk found in drivers with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05. Driving after a sleepless night could be as dangerous as driving drunk because of the reduced alertness and impaired driving. However, the difference is, drinking alcohol is something individuals can choose to do, while for a lot of people, it can be difficult to get enough sleep. A responsible driver should be aware of when they should not drive. At the same time, it should be a responsibility of transportation engineers to ensure that nobody has to drive. People should be able to rely on a robust system of alternatives so they only drive when it is necessary. When your city exclusively builds for cars, it should not be much of a surprise when people drive when they shouldn't. Taking data from Uber and Lyft, reducing the number of DUIs to its logical conclusion, we should apply an urban planning approach to ending drunk driving. This means disincentivizing driving and prioritizing investments in public transit, bike infrastructure, and walkable places. I often hear people describe cars as the epitome of freedom, but there is arguably more freedom in not having to drive. Someone may think to themselves, well, I don't drink and drive, so how does this benefit me? But this isn't about an individual's personal decisions. Even if someone has a designated driver or chooses not to consume alcohol, it doesn't guarantee others won't act irresponsibly. This is the problem with personal responsibility. You as an individual can be doing everything right and still be the victim of a crash. The freedom to not have to drive includes being protected from people who shouldn't be driving because the infrastructure would allow them to instinctually make smarter decisions, such as walking or taking public transit to a location that serves alcohol. Disincentivizing driving would mean heavily investing in transit and changing our zoning laws so there can be more walkable, mixed-use neighborhoods that have bars integrated within them. After all, the problem isn't necessarily the alcohol, it's the fact that people are driving to and from places that serve alcohol. I believe it is reasonable to make driving less convenient for the sake of substantially improving public health and safety. While creating a social stigma and enforcing stricter laws against drunk driving was effective in the 1980s, it has become apparent that we must still do more. If we wanted to make a genuine effort to ending drunk driving, along with the many other negative externalities of a car-dependent transportation system, we would decouple driving from our transportation system altogether, so it is an option, not a requirement. 